So hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture. So I am going to start with a quick review of what we did last time. And that was basically starting to apply the various thermodynamic formula, the ideal gas law and the first law of thermodynamics in order to analyze various kinds of thermodynamic processes. And last time we focused on these special kinds of processes where one of the thermodynamic variables is remaining constant. So constant volume processes, constant pressure processes, and constant temperature processes. And so I will start by reviewing those today. And then we're going to talk about a new kind of process called an adiabatic process, where the heat going in and out of the system is equal to zero. And we'll spend the rest of the lecture today doing some examples related to adiabatic processes. So the review starts with constant volume. We have that situation where if we have a gas in a cylinder, maybe there's a piston, but we're holding it in place, or we just have a, a rigid container like the ideal gas thermometers that we were talking about. We can heat up the gas, the pressure can increase, temperature can increase. And on a PV diagram, this would look just like a vertical line where the volume is remaining constant. And we understood that in general for these processes, we always have from the ideal gas law that PV over T is a constant as long as the amount of gas is remaining the same. And in the specific case of constant volume, that simplifies to P over T is a constant. Or equivalently, we can write T2 over T1 equals P2 over P1. So this is pressure proportional to temperature. If we want to calculate, so that's, that's going to be useful in calculating, say, the final temperature in a process like this if you're given the change in pressure and you're given the initial temperature. The other types of things that we're going to be interested in are the various kinds of energies for this process. So the work is zero because we have a constant volume and so there's, there's, even though the gas is exerting a force on the walls of the container, it's not actually moving the walls. And so you don't have any energy transferred by mechanical means. <clears throat> that means from the first law that we have Q is equal to delta U. And so both of those quantities you can compute using our formula for delta U that we always have, which is NCV delta T. And so just to remind you that this formula, even though it, it has the CV in there, this is actually valid. Delta U equals NCV delta T is true for constant pressure processes or adiabatic processes, whatever process you're talking about. For constant volume, it's also true that Q is equal to NCV delta T. And that's actually wh why there's a, a V here. That The C here is allows you to compute uh, both delta U and Q at constant volume. So the next one is constant pressure. And we understood that one way to achieve a constant pressure process would be to imagine you have a gas in a cylinder, but now your piston is free to move up and down. And we just assume that the piston is in mechanical equilibrium so that at, um, so at, at any particular time, the force upward equals the force downward, which is remaining constant. So if we heat up this gas from some initial configuration to a final configuration, then the pressure in the end is the same as the pressure at the start because the downward force is the same in both cases and the piston is not accelerating. So that means the upward force, which is pressure times area, is also the same before and after. So this looks like a horizontal line on the PV diagram. In this case, PV over T being constant it's going to tell us that V over T is constant. So volume is proportional to temperature. And a useful form of that relation is to say that T2 over T1 for our process is equal to V2 over V1. In terms of energy, work is given by the simplest formula, P delta V. In this case, pressure is constant. And so we don't need any fancy integration. It's just P delta V. It's the area under this curve, which is a rectangle. For heat and the internal energy change, 
we use the same formula as usual for delta u. For q, we have, in this case, q equals delta u plus w. Both of those terms are non-zero. But what we derived last time is that the work, which is p delta v, you can also write that as nr delta t using the ideal gas law. And combining that with the delta u, we get q equals n times cp delta t, where we've just defined cp to be cv plus r. Okay. So when you're wanting to know what cp is, you just look up cv in the table, or it's probably given to you in the question. You add r to it. That's always the formula for cp. And then you can calculate heat in that way. Next one is constant temperature. So in this case, what we imagine is that there's some container and the gas is in thermal equilibrium with the container, which remains at a constant temperature. And so we assume that maybe we're expanding or compressing the gas slowly enough where if we happen to add any energy to the gas because we're doing work on it, then that energy maybe temporarily heats up the gas, but then if it's a higher temperature than the container walls, we'll have heat flow and the gas inside will return to equilibrium with the container wall. So we're imagining that we're doing this process very slowly so that the gas basically always remains at the same temperature as the container walls. In this case, we have that P times V is equal to a constant from our ideal gas law because T is remaining constant. And so pressure, has the relationship to volume, which is the inverse proportionality. Pressure is equal to nRT, which is a constant, divided by V. So your graph looks like a one over X function, and that's indicated here in this diagram. In terms of energy, delta T equals zero, so delta U equals zero because delta U equals NCV delta T. And so that means from the first law, that Q and W are equal to each other. In order to calculate either of those things, then we need to use the fact that W is the area under this curve. And in order to figure out that area, because it's not a simple shape, it's actually this inverse, this one over X type function, we need to use some calculus. You did that in the tutorial last week. And the final answer for that is this formula that the area under the curve here from two to one is nRT, where T is the constant temperature, times the logarithm, the natural logarithm of the ratio of the final over the initial volume. Okay, And so as we expect, if the gas is expanding, final volume is going to be greater. This logarithm is going to be positive, and we get positive work. If the gas is contracting. The thing inside the logarithm is going to be less than one the logarithm will be negative and the work will be negative. All right, so now we're ready to move on to a different type of process. And to introduce that, I have a clicker question for you to think about. So take a moment to read through this question. Here we have a cylinder, which it's, it's almost like the opposite of the previous case where we assumed that the gas was always in thermal equilibrium with the surroundings. We were doing things slowly enough to allow heat to be transferred. In this case, we're assuming that the cylinder is perfectly insulated and we compress the gas in a perfectly insulated cylinder. So take a moment, pause the video and think about what would be true in this case with a perfectly insulated cylinder. Okay, so let's, let's think about this. So the first we can talk about Q. And so Q is the amount of heat that flows into the gas from the environment. But if we're saying that the cylinder is perfectly insulated, then that means there's not going to be any flow of heat in or out of the gas. And so we could say that for this process, Q is going to be equal to zero. What about the change in temperature? So there's a couple of ways of understanding this. First way is to think about just the 
fact that we're compressing the gas. So we're pushing down on this gas. So we're going to be doing some work on the gas. We're transferring energy to the gas through this mechanical process. And that energy has to go somewhere. It can't flow out of the gas into the container walls. So it must remain in the gas and actually increase the energy of the gas molecules themselves. So we expect that the temperature of the gas is going to increase in this process. If we wanted to understand that using our equations, then we could say that using the first law of thermodynamics, we have delta U equals Q minus W. In this case, we have Q equals zero because the walls are perfectly insulating. We have W negative because we're talking about a compression of the gas. And so delta U is positive. And because delta U equals NCV delta T, we can conclude that delta T is also positive. So that case we just considered is a case where Q equals zero because we assumed that the walls of the container were perfectly insulating and therefore not able to transfer any heat. The name we give to a process like that is that it's an adiabatic process. So in this course, adiabatic will mean that Q is equal to zero, no heat is transferred in or out during the process. And there's actually two ways or two situations where we'll end up approximating, making this approximation that Q is equal to zero. And one of them is the one that I just mentioned where you have a gas that's well insulated from the environment. So actually I have a, I have a cylinder here um, with, a, with a piston. And this one you'll notice uh, the, the cylinder is actually made of, if you look closely, it's, it's made of a very thick uh, plasticky material. So this is actually probably quite a good insulator. And so that, that would mean that if I, if I don't take too long with my compression or expansion, probably there's not, not time for the energy in here to travel much into the walls of the cylinder. But even if I have a cylinder whose walls are not a very good insulator, then if I do the process quickly enough, so if I have a very rapid compression of the gas, then what can happen is that during the process, there's just not enough time for the heat to be transferred out of the gas and into the walls of the cylinder. So it, it all depends on how quickly you do it relative to how quickly heat can be transferred from the inside of the cylinder to the walls of the cylinder. So when we have, when we talk about adiabatic processes, generally we're talking about a situation where we're compressing it sort of rapidly enough relative to this, how quickly the heat flows out. And so that might be a slow compression with an extremely well insulated container or a very rapid compression when, uh, when the walls of the container might be a metal. So in, in a, we'll be talking about engines and cars later. And sometimes we approximate the process of uh, compression of the gas as adiabatic um, even though the walls of the cylinder are, are not, you know, they're not very good insulators. Okay, so let's talk about the, the detailed equations that we're going to be using in order to an analyze adiabatic processes. Right, so our definition here is that Q equals zero. So it's a little bit different than the other processes where we had one of our basic thermodynamic variables fixed. In this case, P, V, and T, generally they're all changing during the process. So because we have the ideal gas law and the amount of gas is still remaining constant, we can say that P, V over T is constant, but it turns out that's often not enough to do the kinds of calculations that we, that we want. Um, so often we'll have an adiabatic process and someone will tell you the change in volume and you want to know how does the temperature change or how does the pressure change. 
And so it turns out you generally need more than just this ideal gas law in that case. So what you can derive is another set of formulas that are just relevant to adiabatic processes. And they start by combining this ideal gas law relation with the first law of thermodynamics. Okay. So why don't we talk about the first law and then we'll come back to how do you derive the equations that will allow you to predict pressures and temperatures and volumes. Okay, so because Q is equal to zero, then our first law tells us that work is equal to minus the change in internal energy. And so in this case, we can use, as usual, delta U equals NCV delta T in order to calculate change in energies. But that will also be usually the most efficient way to calculate the work in the process. Okay. So, so calculating Q, delta U, and W is fairly straightforward for adiabatic processes. Um, one of the things that we realize then is that when you compress something adiabatically, it's going to heat up. That was the, basically the last question that NCDV delta T is equal to minus W. So for a compression, W is negative and delta T will be positive. Okay, so let me give you an idea of how we use that together with the ideal gas law to derive this relation. And actually there's another relation here. There's, there's two relations that are going to be useful in predicting pressures and volumes and temperatures in adiabatic processes. So maybe first I'll just tell you what these equations mean. And then we're going to understand a little bit about how we derive those. And I have an entire video that was in the reading assignment that you can watch. And I'll, I'll place a link below so that you can see it. And, um, and so if you want to see the, the gory details of this derivation, you can, um, you can watch those videos. Okay. But first, what do these equations, what do these equations mean? So, You'll notice when we're talking about adiabatic processes, this number gamma comes up a lot. This is a Greek letter, gamma. It is defined to be Cp divided by Cv. And equivalently, we can say that Cv plus R divided by Cv. And so we notice that this is always a number that's greater than one. And the way that it shows up is that for adiabatic processes, PV to the gamma is constant. So it's similar to the equation for isothermal where PV is constant, but now you have a power which is greater than one. And so that means that if you say, if you double the volume, well, for isothermal, that would mean the pressure goes down by a factor of two, for adiabatic, the pressure is going to go down by a larger factor, which is two to the gamma. Okay. And similarly, TV to the gamma minus one is going to be a constant. So for example, if you know the initial volume and the final volume and the initial pressure, you can use this to predict the final pressure. If you know the initial volume and the initial temperature and the final volume, you can use this to predict the final temperature. So just very briefly, I'll give you an idea of where these things come from. And so the point is that if you know we have that PV over T is NR, if I have some change in volume, we can't then just use this to figure out how to say the temperature changes because the pressure is also changing. So this is not enough. The ideal gas law is not enough information to predict the changes in pressure from the changes in volume or the changes in temperature from the changes in volume because generally both things are changing. And so in order to actually derive our equation for the change in temperature, what we can instead do is start from the definition of adiabatic, that Q is equal to zero. Then we can convert that into, so that tells us that the change in internal energy equals minus W. 
Okay, so we can write this down as an equation. If we imagine a very small change in temperature, then the change in internal energy is NCVDT, and the change in the work is P times the change in volume. Okay, so pressure is changing here, so that's why I'm restricting to infinitesimal changes in volume and changes in temperature. And now we can rewrite in this equation the pressure in terms of the volume and the temperature. So now I'm going to use the ideal gas law to say that P is equal to nRT over V. And so that gives me that NCV dt is nRT over V times dV. And just rearranging that thing a little bit, what I find is that dt over t is equal to minus R over CV dV over V. Okay, so this is kind of a complicated, this is looks a little bit complicated, but basically what you notice is that it relates the changes in temperature to the changes in volume without any reference to pressure. So if you watch the other video about sort of deriving the equations here, then there's basically just an integration step where you go from this equation to this equation here. Okay. And so that at least gives you a sense of where these things are coming from. This is simply a consequence of the ideal gas law and the first law of thermodynamics. And once you have this, then together with the ideal gas law, you, you can derive this equation as well. And so going forward, we, you know, we don't need to do these derivations every time we're analyzing an adiabatic process. We're basically just going to be able to use that PV to the gamma equals constant as a method to say, predict the final pressure in a process. We're gonna be able to use TV to the gamma minus one equals constant in order to predict final temperatures. Okay, so that was a lot of talking. The rest of the class, we're going to do some examples and actually make use of all these formulas for adiabatic processes. Question number one, we wanna understand what does the adiabatic process look like on a graph? So take a minute to read through this question and think about the answer. The question is which one of these lines might represent the adiabatic compression of the gas and which one represents the isothermal compression of a gas? Okay, so I'm actually going to give you two different derivations of this result. The answer for this question turns out to be B, that the solid line represents the adiabatic process. So how can we understand that? So one way we could do this is simply by using the equations relating pressure and volume for either isothermal or adiabatic. So for isothermal, what we have is that PV equals constant. And so that means that P is equal to some constant divided by V. For adiabatic, we have that PV to the gamma equals constant this is some other constant. And so we have P is equal to constant, some other number divided by V to the gamma. And so what we're looking here for, look, what we're looking at here is the effect of decreasing the volume. Okay, so we notice that because gamma is larger than one, that if I decrease the volume, in both cases, the pressure is going to increase, but in the second case, the pressure is going to increase more because I have a higher power. So for example, if gamma were equal to two and we decrease the volume by a factor of two, 
then in this case, the pressure would increase by a factor of two. But in the other case, the pressure would increase by a factor of four. So because we have a power which is larger than one here, the relationship between pressure and volume is stronger than in the case where we have a constant temperature. And so looking at the graph, we can conclude that the top graph where you have a larger change in pressure for the same change in volume must be the adiabatic one. What about a conceptual understanding? How could we understand, without reference to this complicated formula, how could we understand that the top one should be adiabatic? So to understand that, let's have a look at these two pictures and get an intuitive understanding of why we might end up with a higher pressure in the adiabatic case. So in both cases, we're doing some work on the gas. We're adding energy to the gas through this mechanical process. And so W for the gas is going to be negative. It's gaining energy. And but what we can say is that in the first case, the gas is not allowed to heat up. Okay, so, so because it's isothermal, delta U is going to be equal to zero. And so whatever energy we put in by doing this work is going to leave the gas and go into the walls of the container. So the temperature of the gas doesn't increase in this case, and that's just by definition. In the other case, Q is equal to zero. And so this work that we're doing is necessarily going to increase the temperature of the gas. There's no other place for the energy to go. So we push on the gas, the gas gets hotter. And so in that case, what we can conclude is that after an equal change in volume, in the second case, in the adiabatic case, the temperature of the gas is gonna be higher. And so by the ideal gas law, since we have the same final volume in both cases, and we have a higher temperature in the adiabatic case, we must have a higher final pressure in the adiabatic case. And so that's another way of seeing that the top graph with the higher final pressure must be the one for the adiabatic case. Okay. So for these adiabatic compressions, what we have is sort of, you know, completely transferring our energy that we, that we use by do, that we give by doing work on the gas, we're completely transferring that energy to the gas molecules themselves. And so we end up getting these very large increases in temperature and in pressure. Let's try to quantify that. So I want you to think about this question, which has to do with a situation like this, where we have a, a gas, which is air in the cylinder, for air, we can approximate CV to be about three times R. It's initially at room temperature, and we're gonna compress it very rapidly in the cylinder. What I'm telling you is that the compression ratio, the ratio between the initial volume and the final volume is a factor of 15. Okay, so I'm gonna press this down uh, very rapidly so that the change in volume, that the volume decreases by a factor of 15. And I want you to estimate the final temperature of the gas. And then I also want you to figure out how much work was required in order to do this compression of the gas. So pause the video and take a, take a few minutes to think about that. Okay. And so we're gonna talk about part A first. And if you want, then you could try to choose one of these answers for part A. So again, if, if your answer doesn't match any of these, maybe go back and think through it and see if you can get an answer that matches one of these. Okay, so let's actually work this out. So for part A of this question, what we know is that the T initial equals room temperature. So let's say uh, 293 Kelvin, if it's 20 degrees Celsius in our room, we know that the compression ratio, so the, the 
larger volume over the smaller volume is 15. And what we want is to predict the final temperature. And so clearly this is a situation where knowing that TV to the gamma minus one is constant should allow us to figure out the final temperature because this tells us the proportionality between temperature and volume. It says temperature is proportional to one over V to the gamma minus one. So in the practice, the way we can use this equation is first, we'll go ahead and calculate gamma. Okay, so gamma is always this number, CV plus R divided by CV. And in this question, we're told that CV equals three R. So we can substitute that in and we end up finding that R cancels as it always will. So we're always gonna get a pure number. And in this case, that number is four over three. So in our proportionality, what we need is gamma minus one, and that's going to be equal to one third. So using this relation, what we can say is that T2 times V2 to the gamma minus one is equal to T1 times V1 to the gamma minus one. And then we can rearrange to find that T2 is equal to T1 times V1 over V2 to the gamma minus one. Now we can just put in the information that we're given in the question. So T2 is equal to 293 Kelvin times 15. This is our compression ratio showing up and then to the power of one third. And if we work that out, it ends up being approximately equal to 723 Kelvin. Okay, so, so that is really hot. Apparently just by compressing the gas in a cylinder like this, if the, if the change in volume is by a factor of 15, then we can increase the temperature of the air inside the cylinder by over 400 degrees Celsius. So we'd like to understand, is that actually realistic? Can you actually make it that hot? I mean, if you can make it that hot, then you should be able to you know, burn stuff. And so what I'm going to do now is actually give you a demonstration that this is a possibility. So let's have a look at this demo. All right, so welcome to another one of Mark's candlelight demos. Here we have a candle, it's actually an ethanol burner. I'm using it for another demo, but it added a nice ambiance to this demo. What we're really gonna be focusing on is this cylinder. It's just a, a standard glass cylinder and it's filled with air. And here I have a piston and the piston is going to be placed into the cylinder and that will allow us to compress the air inside the cylinder. It fits snugly. And what I'm gonna to try to do is compress the air very rapidly so that it doesn't have time for the heat that I'll produce to, to escape uh, to the environment. And so what I'm hoping is that we're actually gonna be able to heat up the air enough in order to ignite a little bit of cotton that I have at the bottom of the cylinder. So let's give it a try. Here we go. So three, two, one. Oh, Try again. Three, two, one. There it was. So that was obviously a really bright flash, and that was our cotton igniting because the air got so hot because of the adiabatic compression. Okay. Let's go back to the slides here. So, uh, so that was exciting. Um, so we saw that at least the second time I did it. I was actually able to compress it enough that the cotton just spontaneously ignited and we had this very bright flash where the cotton burned up inside the cylinder. And if you look up, if you Google search the 
like spontaneous ignition temperature of cotton, then you find it's actually, it's around uh, 400 degrees Celsius. And so that was sort of just, uh, at least in the numbers that I, we used in our calculation, that the 15 times was just enough compression in order to ignite that cotton. Um, so I know what you're thinking, you probably want to see that zoomed in and in slow motion. So let's actually, let's actually try that here. Got a separate video where, where I did that. And let's pause that for a second. So we'll go up here and all right, here we go. Very impressive. I think I think I want to go even slower. So let's let's go to oh what the heck. Let's go to high definition. Let's go to uh, zero point two five playback speed. The ultra slow motion here. Boom. One more time. I'll put the links for these videos down below so you can watch them larger and uh, see see the full gory details of our adiabatic compression. All right. So that's pretty much it. Actually, let me just deal with question B. There was another part to this question. So we'd estimated the final temperature of the gas. And then just as another example for adiabatic compression, we can ask about what happens if you want to know, uh, so you, you compress the gas and you want to know how much work was it that I actually needed to add to the gas in order to achieve that spectacular result. And we're told that the tube contains 0 0.0004 moles of gas. And so we want to know how much work it was that we need to do. So this is quite simple. We do not, we want to know work. Generally, when we're thinking about any of these questions related to energy, it's useful to start by writing down the first law of thermodynamics. So delta U equals Q minus W. In this case, Q is equal to zero. And so what we learn is that work equals minus delta U. And so we would have work equals minus N C V delta T. And now we just put in the number of moles that we're told we put in C V equals three R and we put in delta T equals uh, whatever it was, 700 and uh, 723 Kelvin minus 293 Kelvin. And just plugging those in, you end up with 4.3 joules. Okay. So that's it for today. And next time, now that we're equipped with our knowledge of how to analyze all of these different kinds of thermodynamic processes individually, we're going to start putting them together into various interesting cycles. And we'll be able to analyze things like internal combustion engines and diesel engines and refrigerators. So we'll see that starting on Wednesday.